Good morning, church. Good morning, virtual church. Good morning. This morning, I'm, I titled my sermon, The Devil's Work or the New Life. And uh, James Hurley, go ahead and make your way on up here. James was there at Washington, D.C. On, on Wednesday, and he's going to share with you briefly what he saw and what happened. And uh, he, he contacted me and let me know about it, and um, I prayed about it, and I thought about it, and everything he's going to share is going to go right along with my sermon, so I felt that we needed to hear what he had to say. Uh, James and, and some of his friends, they're Marines, they're, you know, they're veterans, they, they, they've served for our country, and they went there to uh, peacefully protest and to demonstrate, to see what in the world's going on, and... Um, you guys know the rest of the story, so he's going to share from his perspective of what he saw. James? Oh, right. he also grew up in this church. Yes. yes. I want to read a scripture that um, I read to everyone on the bus as we were riding to D.C. from our, ho our hotel. It just felt appropriate at the time, and it was noted in my Bible by my dad before I went to boot camp. And this is Psalms 139.7. Uh, Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you will revive me. You will stretch out your hand, and your right hand will save me. The Lord will watch, or the Lord will perfect that which concerns me. Your mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Do not forsake the works of your hands. And as I sat there in boot camp, not knowing what I was doing, I wrote this. God is with us, always by our side, through all trials and every tribulation. I grew up in this church, and most of you watched me grow up. And you supported me when I left for the Marines and I went to combat. So I want to start by saying thank you for your prayers and support. God was truly with me and my friends on our way to D.C. He was with us as we tried to find the caravan where we were supposed to meet up with in Louisville, Kentucky. We stopped to use the restroom and stretch our legs for a moment. And I took a second to stop and pray and ask God for strength and some guidance and some clarity. As I started to get back in the car and we went to pull away, I looked up and I saw car after car with flags waving, hazard lights flashing and waving at us to come along. I realized we had found the caravan. So we hit the road and we joined them. Over 150 cars joined us between Louisville and Kentucky and DC. We made it safely to our hotel and prepared for the next day, getting some much needed sleep. God was with us as we were sightseeing around DC. He was with us as President Trump gave his speech, and it was beautiful. As we marched to the Capitol building, chanting USA, praying, singing God was also with us. I could feel it in my bones. And even though I was sore and tired, none of that mattered. I was marching with the silent majority as we were no longer silent and trying peacefully to make our voices heard. God's glory was all around us, and I felt joy like I'd never had before. Sorry. He was with me when I was trying to regroup with my team and make my way through the crowd of fellow patriots as we arrived on the green behind the Capitol building. I genuinely feel it was at this point the devil took the opportunity to divide my team. I couldn't reach anyone from home, and I couldn't reach any of my, my, my team by cell phone or radio. Even still, God was with me when I almost fell and got trampled to death in the minutes that followed. He was with my best friend as he searched for me for over two hours. I witnessed great patriotism and kindness and love. I saw thousands of Americans standing in unity for American values and God. And I felt this all the way up to the point where I was standing on the Capitol steps looking back at the Washington Monument and wondering to myself what was going to happen next as I saw with my very own eyes people patriot pretending to be patriots, pretending to be Trump supporters. and you and I, breaking windows, shoving the police and throwing things at actual patriots and Christians and good people. They were dressed primarily in black and they were doing all they could to antagonize the police and all the innocent people around them. And once again, the devil took the four of us being separated and used it to distract us from what was really happening. We tried to stop them and we failed. I'm sorry, I could not do more. Okay. 
The chaos I saw was upsetting to say the least. But even still, I witnessed kindness and hope as fellow Trump supporters, patriots, and Christians began singing and pray and picking up trash inside and outside of the Capitol and helping one another to safety. This is why I went to D.C. on January 6th. We have only just begun to fight. Do not be dismayed or discouraged. God is still with us in this time of uncertainty. We must blow the trumpets of revival once again and set our faith in the Lord and Savior. For too long we have been mocked and patronized by politicians for our faith and for our patriotism. I can't speak for everyone that went to D.C. and stood on those steps. I can only speak for myself. But I believe that's the beauty of the First Amendment. As for me and my future, I've had enough. I love you all, and I pray these words of truth inspire you. Thank you, Cam. Um, as we were riding on the bus to D.C., I, I grabbed my Bible, and I just was like, God, I need to share something. I need to, to, to you know, get everybody excited. And I flipped open to the cover my Bible, and there's a quote from Sister Meadows in here. A man does not fail by making mistakes. He fails by quitting. And the whole subway I started to so You guys were there with me. Thank you. Thank you, James. Thank you for serving our country, and thank you for peacefully protesting and trying to keep that protest peaceful. As I said this morning, what he had to share is what's really on my heart as well. I don't care what side of the aisle you're on politically, but when death and destruction and people feel like they've been violated, that's the devil's work. All right? I know there's people. I got family members and other people I know that um, they don't have my political views, and that's all right, because my, my first of all goal is to get people right with the Lord Jesus Christ, and then I let, I let the Holy Spirit iron everything else out, you know. Um, this is probably going to be one of the more political sermons I've ever given, so um, if you check out on me, I love you. God loves you. <laughs> It's all right, you know, it's fine. Um, Jesus is my, my, my hope. And, um, and uh, my prayer is that he's your hope too. Um, the president is not my Lord and Savior. But the Bible does say to pray for him, and I do. And um, I've lived my Christian life out where I've actually prayed for two different uh, presidents, one I like more than the other, but the Bible says for me to pray, and I can now finally stand before you humbly. I'm not, pr I'm not proud up here. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying, look at me. I'm a super Christian, you know. No, I, I have, I have prayed for every leader that we've had, as the Bible has told us to do. When I realized the Bible is serious about that, <laughs> and I did so. This morning, I'm going to read one verse, and the whole sermon is coming from that one verse, and it's John 10.10. 10. Let's look at it now. It says, the thief does not come except to steal, to kill, and destroy. And then here's the words of Jesus. This is Jesus talking, by the way. But this is Jesus now talking about himself. I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. Amen? Amen? Let's pray. Lord, again, I thank you for your word. I thank you, Lord, that your spirit breathed it out. And Lord, I just plead your blood over me and this congregation, and I ask that your spirit who breathed this out and is living in me, Lord, will speak. Lord, I ask that everything I say be according to your word, and Lord, that we will hear what your spirit is saying. And, Lord, if I say anything that's not according to your word, I ask, Lord, that it just be forgotten. Because, Lord, I'm not perfect. And I'm not your son. 
But I thank you, Lord, you're making me more like your son. Lord, I ask that again, as I prayed this morning already, Lord, that your spirit will take over this. And Lord, that truth will be told right here and also in this country. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. 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 A few starting points I just want to make. The devil's work started in the garden. When he caused man to look into their own self-interest. James mentioned my grandmother. That's Sister Meadows, for those of you who don't know. And she taught us a song in Sunday school, and it was Jesus and others in you. What a wonderful way to spell joy. Our focus is always on God. Our focus is always on others. And we, are, we understand that Jesus will take care of us. We take care of his business. We take care of one another. And we know that God will take care of us. That's how it works. That's the biblical order of things. And I could go into that, but a whole other teaching and sermon for another time. When they decided to not do what God says, they caused this thing called a sin nature. Politically, I'm one of those people who I don't trust big governments. Because I do believe in the saying that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the reason I believe that, because I can theologically tell you, as a, as, a, as a person who studies the word of God, that everybody has a sin nature. And my best interest may not be at your heart at any given moment. You understand? That goes for fellow Christians. I don't know what's going on with you. You might have a bad day. I thought, my, I thought I was clear to pull out in front of you, and you told me I was number one. We could be two people who love Jesus. I mean, really, you know? But my best interest is not at your heart because you signaled to me what you signaled to me. So, okay, all right. Maybe I deserve that, and I should pray for you. <laughs> when man looks into their own self-interest, it's never good. Jesus on the cross provided the only way for us to get out of our sin nature or to kill it on the cross when he displayed selflessness. And, of course, that is the love of God. Politicians are in place for the interests of the people who elected them. Okay? Politicians are faced with the temptation of working for their own self-interest. That temptation is right there. Anyone who's lived a little and been involved, you know, in any political thing, you, you understand it. As a pastor, I'm tempted. I can abuse my power at any given time. I could. That's why the Bible tells you to pray for us. Any leader. If a person works for their self-interest, it can cause what the Bible calls a trespass to happen. And people around them will be affected, affected negatively, therefore making self-interest work the devil's work. And as Pastor Mel has quoted a Bob Dylan song, when Bob Dylan got right with God, you're going to serve somebody. In Romans 6, it lets you know that you're either a slave to righteousness or you're a slave to sin. You will serve somebody. Well... Pastor, religious leader guy, I don't believe in God and I don't believe in the devil. Okay, you're still going to serve somebody. Because I know, because of my experience with God, God does exist. And I know my experience from what the Word of God tells me. I can turn on the news and I can see that's the devil's work. Death, destruction, and theft is the devil's work. So you'll serve somebody. I pray you come to know the Lord Jesus Christ and serve him and stop hurting people. And let me just get humble here. When I wasn't living for God, I was hurting people. Let that sink in. Your pastor hurt people. I let people down. I said mean things that they heard that I said. I took advantage. A 
of people for my own self-interest. I'm no better than anyone in this world. I'm just saved by grace. The thief comes. The thief does not come except to steal, kill, and destroy. Let's talk about this thief. The thief in the story, if you put this all in the context that it comes in, can't be the devil since he came to hinder the sheep. For those who brought your Bible with you, or if you're on your cellular device, you can just scroll to the top of it. Jesus said this, Most assuredly I say to you, he who enters the sheepfold by the door, but climbs up the other way, is the same as a thief and a robber. But he who enters the door is the, door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the doorkeeper opens, and the, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calls his own sheep by, their, by name and leads them out. And when he brings them out, he, he, out he, his own sheep, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. Yet by no means will they follow a stranger, but they will flee from him, for they do not know the voice of a stranger. Church, that's why I don't trust anyone I don't know. I don't. I really don't. Like I said in the last a couple sermons ago, uh, someone asked me, did you lose your faith in humanity? I said, yeah. <laughs> did you lose your faith in doctors? Yeah, 13 months ago. If you're not my primary physician, I don't care what you say. And, you know, the last time I spoke, I, I, I said this too. I said, you know, what is up with all these doctors who are now becoming politicians? I thought a, a, a politician's a good g gig. But now I got to think about this. I need to retract that because reverends decided to become politicians. And they're just using this to fund their political cause. I should pray for them. Not good. So let me retract that statement. I just don't trust anyone I don't know. <laughs> But yes, the thief in this story can be the devil. Back at 844, he told, the, he told the Jews that you serve your father, the devil. And that really ticked him off, and we've got some more I am statements out of that. Just like right here, we get the I am statement of I am the door. Jesus is the door to the sheep. And so for me, I'm going to say yes, the thief here is the devil. And we also, in this passage, we get hirelings. If you go and read on, who work for their own self-interest. John, do you trust politicians? No, I don't. I'm convinced about 90% of them work for themselves. They work for their self-interest. And that is the party that I'm a registered to. I'll tell you, the party that I'm registered to, I believe that 9% of them are a bunch of crooks. I don't like them. I don't trust them. The thief, right, comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Still, do you guys realize that a million or so people were at Washington, D.C. because they believed that the previous election was stolen from them, and many of them came to peacefully protest, which has already happened before. I believe it happened twice before. People have ascended on Washington, D.C. to pr protest this last election, and it was peaceful. I know a lot of you don't listen to the national media anymore, and I'm with you now. I can care less what the national media says. Say what you're going to say. I might listen to you. I don't believe the talking heads on my TV anymore. Well, let's talk about stealing. I brought up the idea of, of trespass. The, the Bible calls sin, it also calls it a trespass. If I was a mechanic and I had a $240 tool in my garage and somebody got 
word that I have these special tools, and one of them was worth $240, and they think, shoot, I could hawk that and support my habits, my addiction, or whatever they got going on with them that's making them not godly. They will have to break a lock or a window. They will have to go into an area that is obviously off limits of everyone else because that is my area, and I don't want anyone in there. That's why breaking and entry is also a crime, not just stealing, breaking, destruction. We'll get to that here in a minute, right? And then what do they do? They walk in. They take what is not theirs, and they leave. I come home. I feel violated. I'm upset. I'm not happy. I'm out of $240 plus whatever it costs to fix the window or the lock or whatever it was that they broke. Now, in this story, the robber, and I just read it to you, this is the first five verses, how does he enter unnaturally? This morning, we unlocked all the doors, and we let people in. And then we locked the front before service starts, and we locked some people out. So, sorry about that. But then we let them in. Everybody naturally walked into this place, Right? Being stolen from is not fun. It's not a fun feeling. Kill. Let's talk about kill. They, the thief, will kill the sheep for themselves. The thief. Why, why, let's go back to the Bible times and put this thing in its proper context. Why does the thief come to kill? Because he wants the goods from the sheep. Again, goes along with stealing because that now devastates the, the owner of the sheep, the true owner of the sheep, because now they're financially out of that sheep or any other sheep they got a hold of. You understand that the Bible was written in an agriculture culture, agriculture time of culture, right? So when anything ever happened to a field, they're out. They're not like today where they have insurance on fields. You know, say a fire happens and burns up all the wheat. That means they're going to... Probably start a dev this, this next year if something happened to their field. If someone came and took their animal, that probably means they're going to starve to death. That's what it means. It causes death. Right? So what do they do? They come and they kill the sheep for themselves. God is the God of life. And he gives it a new. When you get a hold of God, you get a hold of the one who made you, who breathed the life breath into you. And also, he now lives with you and continues to replenish you anew every moment you want it. Anybody want something from God right now? Just breathe. Thank you, Jesus. You need his strength, pray in the Spirit. He, he, he fills us up anew. In the context of the Gospel of John, we've been studying this on Sunday nights. This eternal life comes presently and is forever. Every time you hear someone preach a good salvation message, they'll tell you that this eternal life starts right now when you say yes to Jesus. Is that true? Yes. I can even prove it in the Greek grammar, which I've been doing on Sunday nights. whoop do? look at me. I took three classes of Greek. You know, all right. I just know some things. All right, and you can laugh at me. You should. Feel free to laugh at me. I really am a dork, and I need Jesus every minute. It's like right now, I don't even know where I'm at. <laughs> when we get to the end of this context, we're going to talk about the abundant life. So don't check out on me. I know a lot of this is going to be very heavy this morning. <clears throat> but the good news is still good, right? He gives it to us anew eternally and abundantly. Now back to some political things. And if you check out on me, that's all right. I love you. It's fine. I know everyone in this church from the past times, we've always been this way and we, we we're vocal about it. So I, I don't feel too uncomfortable talking about it. 
If a politician does not believe that life is sacred in its most vulnerable form in the womb of a mother, I won't trust you with my life. I won't. If you don't think that that life is precious and is any better than your life and it has its whole entire life ahead of them and you feel it's all right to take their life and then you get on TV and you tell me to trust in what's going on, no, I don't. I don't trust you. I mean, is, is that bad logic or am I right on? There's a party that I, I, I'm not registered as. And there's probably some godly people in it, probably. I knew some in California that vote that way and love Jesus. They don't make sense to me coming from Kansas, but, you know, I got my perspective. They got theirs. But the reason why I'll never have anything to do with that party is because they won't stop killing babies. Simple as that. They do stand for some good things. I believe that we should help people out. You know, I believe people need a leg up. Unions, unions can be a good thing. They keep wages fair. But as I said earlier, everything has the ability to, to be corrupt because you get corrupt people in there and they get self-interest. So anything gets big, you get the devil in it. And as I preached before, Jesus had 12 disciples and one was the devil. The devil was in the church before the church ever started. Just, you know. But yeah, I mean, there's, there's some things they stand for, and I'm with them on it. Th those can be good. But I won't vote for you. Until you get to the point that you allow people in your party to be free thinkers, and they can vote outside of your party, or vote not along with your party's interests, and then I'll I might just support you. Because if life in the womb is not precious to you, when I'm old and retired and sitting in a nursing home, and I'm like what Hitler called a useless eater, what's going to stop you from euthanasia? Well, Pastor John, you, have, you had wisdom and you led a church for, for, for many years. And now you're sitting in a nursing home, and your mind's still with you, but you, um, you're you done. We're going to check you out. <laughs> Sorry, church, I'm about to go somewhere. <laughs> Help me, spirit. Should I go there or not? We got a shot for you. All right, I went there. There we go. Okay. Destroy. <laughs> Help me, Jesus. People were destroyed financially when they lost their livestock. And I talked about that all right, already. Their means of livelihood now do not exist. They took it from them. The thief came in and took the sheep, took them, killed them, used them for themselves. I, w I looked this up in the Greek. This word also means to make it desolate. Do you guys know that there's been many, many protests this last year, and they left areas desolate? That is the devil's work. Another thing that the devil wants to destroy is your mind. He wants to take down your intellect. Jesus said, we are to love God with all of our mind, our whole heart, soul, strength, and mind. When Jesus quoted from what's, what's called in the Old Testament, the grace from all, he threw in the word mind. Probably because you knew Gentile readers and people in 2021 are going to be reading this text and wondering, you know, what, is it just our heart? No, the Jewish understanding when they talk about their heart, they're talking about your emotions and your intellect. 
modern day times, we separate that. We, we call our heart and we call our, you know, our mind. All right. I preached this last time, and I'm going to have us do this again. I want everyone to put your hand on your head. Remember not to touch your face because that's how viruses spread, but touch your head. All right. Inside of your hand, or hands, if you put both hands on your head, is a brain. God gave you that brain. This brain is different from every other ma mammal. Science will back this up. And he gave it to you to think. Church, think. Think for yourself. Read the scriptures. Understand what they're saying. Get good interpretation. Know what God wants from you. And think. Don't just take my word for it. Please read it yourself. Please study it for yourself. I can be corrupt and lead, lead you astray. I could do it. Reasoning. We should be reasoning at everything. That goes along with the subject of philosophy. Well, here's a great philosopher. This is what he had to say. He said, if all the world were Christian, it might not be a matter if the, if the world were educated. But a culture, life will exist outside of the church, whether it exists inside or not. What he's getting at is this. The whole world's not Christian. And there's people who are not in the church and they're not listening to the word of God. Therefore, they're coming up with terrible reasoning of things. That's just the way it is. But he said this. He said, good philosophy must exist if for no other reason, because bad philosophy needs to be answered. That was C.S. Lewis. Also, a new assault on your mind is about being PC and gender inclusive. And now they've even worked with the word, amen. Robin, I'm going to use you for a minute. Is that okay? Okay. Robin was, was born a girl. She grew up to be a woman. She got married. We know what happens on, on marriage nights. We'll go there, but you guys understand, you know, reproduction. And that made her a biological woman. But before I go to what a father is, Steve, are you offended? You, you can't be a mother. Robert, are you okay? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm all right. I think I'm all right, too. Maybe because I know God. Okay. Back to Robin. Okay, so she's also a spiritual mother. She speaks into kids' lives. Kevin and Robin both ran the youth group, and they're saying that they taught. I still remember. Kevin is not my biological father, but he's spoken to my life. You guys understand this? Now, the Speaker of the House, and I'm going to give her the courtesy she's not given the President of the United States, she wrote new rules of, reg of, of legislation for the House that they have to use gender-inclusive words in their documents. Now, a fact checker popped up on my computer and says, now understand that the Speaker of the House did not say that people can't have free speech, so if they're telling a story about their, their great-grandma, you know, they can say that. But when it comes to the documents... They have to say things that are gender inclusive. Okay, Miss Pelosi, I'll give you that courtesy that you're not giving the President of the United States right now because you didn't hear his speech. It's pretty sad right now that you have to go to a different source besides the major networks to actually listen to the speech in full. I had to go to a, a right wing group that just to listen to the president speak. His voice has been stolen from him. Serial killers and axe murderers get better treatment and they can defend themselves against accusations better than the president of the United States right now. I don't care if you don't like him or not. I, yeah, he's, he, he can be a real jerk. Yeah, I know. I watched him operate. Yeah, I watched him operate. I was like, well, they ain't quite Christ-like. But you know what? 
he still has his voice. Enough of that. Now, now, politicians, now, you finally did it. Politicians have finally did it. This is what they've done. I told you before, I'm not, I'm not a doctor. So, you know, talk to your physician that you trust, that you know for whatever medical advice you need. You ask me what I think, I'll give you my gut instincts, but, but it's not an educated advice because I'm not a doctor, all right? I'm not a politician, I'm not a scientist, you know, I'm none of those. But now politicians have came against the word amen. Okay, now you've stepped into my su subject. You have stepped into my subject. The word amen is a transliteration from the Hebrew, and it's also a transliteration in the Greek, and it's been transliterated into English. And you're like, what does that mean? It means in English, it's a man. In Greek, it's a man. In Hebrew, where it came from, is a man. I'm away from my notes. Let me show off for a second. In Hebrew, it's Aleph, Mem, Nun. There's a group called the Masoretic Test. They put in vowel points. Aleph, Mem, Noon. Aleph is a silent A, but with the Masoretic Tech vowel points, you can sound it out, and they put more vowel points under the, the, the letter Mim, and it comes out Amen. In Greek, I looked it up. Sure enough, I was right. Alpha, Mu, Eta, which is a different A than Alpha, and Nu. How's that pronounced in the Greek? Amen. And this cleaver guy, who's a reverend, he's not the first to do this. They did this five years ago. Groups in, say, like San Francisco, God bless people in San Francisco, they need God's help, decided to start being cute and say a woman at the end of their little prayers that they do to the great force in the wind. I don't know what they pray to. And, they'll, and they, they used to do that to be cute. But it's asinine. And now a politician has picked it up, and he showed himself to be absurd. The word amen has nothing to do with male, gender. It has nothing to do with that. And for fun, because I heard this other guy go off on us, like, yeah, the, the guy's right that I was listening to. Are we going to change the word mandate to women date? <laughs> for fun, I looked it up. Google's actually still useful to me. I, I looked it up on Google. Man is manis. Dare is, is um, you got man, man, man dare is the, is the Latin word. Man is part of what means hand. Dear means to give. And those in the military, you understand that you'll get your mandate. They'll hand you your orders. Am I right? right. They'll hand you your orders. That word in the English that's been around since the 16th century has nothing to do with gender. Church. They're trying to make you stupid. They're trying to destroy your mind. Please educate yourself. Moving on. You guys ready for some good news? Jesus said, I have come. I'll take an amen, yeah. Amen. amen. Praise you, Lord. So let it be. So let it be. Yes and amen. Let it be. It's true. It is true. I have come that they may have life, and they may have it more abundantly. 
this life starts presently and eternally like we've been talking about on the Sunday night's Bible studies. Once you get a hold of Jesus, your whole life changes, your forever changes. And it doesn't stop there, like when I took up the offering. It comes with all sorts of benefits. One, if you ever have to face death, you're all right. You'll be fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about death. And as I preached before, don't ever get, don't ever get caught up in fear. fear. That's the devil's work. Once the devil has your mind, he has everything. But if you give him no place in your mind, but you fill your mind with what the Word of God says, what truth is, he can't destroy you. All right? So when you get a hold of God, you have forever ahead of you, and you get benefits. Jesus is the source of life. At the first part of this gospel, it talks about how the Word was there when the creation was made. And he's also the source of our spiritual life. Because of the cross, we now have his spirit living in us, which means it comes with him helping us live out his ways. I titled this The Devil's Work or the New Life. The new, work, the, the new life has a byproduct of the work of God. There's no working for it. It just happens. One of these days you might go, shoot, I have free time. I need to call Mel. Hey, you guys need to get some groceries? Can I help? Because God's working in you. He's leading you. It just happens. You got, the, you got, let, let, let me really, all right. I've been preaching on bad things all morning. Here we go. Let's preach on something good. You have the spirit of the living God in you. Amen. That breathed out that scripture. That led the Lord Jesus through the 33 years that he lived on this earth to accomplish everything he needed to accomplish in a three-year ministry. That same spirit is in you. That same spirit that's been breathing out this word from the very beginning is in you. And it doesn't stop there. That same spirit that is in you can raise the dead according to Romans 8, 11. You can raise the dead. That same spirit is in you when you said yes to Jesus. So what does that mean? It means you have an abundance. When God made life, he said it was good. And then at the end of it, he said it was good, good. Which we translate very good, but the, the Hebrew word is tov, tov. Everything is tov, and now it's tov, tov. All right? It's tov, right? It's good. And now it's more abundant. You can do anything you need to do in this life because the Spirit of God is in you working with you. Again, you can raise the dead. I love saying that. Church, you can raise the dead. Are you talking metaphorically or spiritually? Both. I mean, metaphorically, spiritually, or physically. Yes. All, all the above. Whatever your faith allows you to believe. Yes, you can raise the dead. That means all things are possible to you according to this scripture. And, again, you can speak life into someone. You could be a spiritual mother. You can actually speak the very words of God into someone and change their entire life and change their entire course. All things are possible. Everything from God is good. Life is good. An abundant life is more of the, of the good, right? It's more of the good of life in you, being lived through you, and is being seen. Amen? So again, to recap, I preached this before. You can be part of the problem, or you can be part of the solution. You can be in the solution and still be a part of the problem. But thank God, the Spirit of God lives in you. He'll correct you. He'll help you. He'll lead you and guide you. You can actually show up to a peaceful protest and be part of the solution. Helping people understand destruction is not of God. Please knock it off. 
Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for your message. I thank you, Lord, for every good thing you've given me, and every good thing you've put in me, and every good thing you've put into the church. Lord, I ask now that they receive what your word says. And again, if anything I said, Lord, wasn't lined up with you, Lord, I pray they just forget. Lord, I ask that your spirit was heard, and Lord, that we'll continue to heed what your spirit is saying to us today to get through this life. Lord, a lot of us believe we're in a dark hour, but Lord, I thank you that you are the light that shined in the darkness, and you defeated it. Continue to shine in me and change me, Lord, to come to know you more and more. And Lord, I pray that for the congregation that you've given me to lead. Help me, Lord, to be the shepherd that you need me to be so I can shepherd the people to the great shepherd who's going to bring us home. I give you praise, glory, and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.